So we can see the discipline with which Justice Sri Krishna leads his life. I had informed him he'd get seven minutes. He took six minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> but also some very important lessons that we have learned from you today. Our next recipient is Dr. Usha Thakkar. And I would request our managing committee member and joint finance secretary, Ms. Madhvi Kamath, to read the citation. Professor Usha Thakkar, a scholar of repute who has also played an active role in public life. She retired as professor and head, Department of Political Science, SNDT Women's University, Mumbai. She has been a vice president of the Asiatic Society of Bombay, as also the vice president of Banasthali Vidyapit, a deemed university for women, Rajasthan. At present, she is president and trustee of the Mani Bhavan Gandhi Sangrahale. Professor Thakkar did her PhD from the University of Bombay in 1973. The subject of her doctoral thesis was Diplomacy in Kautilya's Arthashastra. Right from the beginning of her career, Professor Thakkar was recipient of several prestigious awards and fellowships. Special mention must be made of the postdoctoral Fulbright Fellowship, which, she gave, which gave her the opportunity to pursue her research at the University of Chicago in 1981-82, and later in 1990, as a senior Fulbright Fellow at Cornell University, Professor Usha Thakkar was awarded a fellowship from the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute for pursuing her academic research at York University, Canada. She has also been a visiting fellow at the Sheffield Polytechnic, UK. Professor Thakkar's focus of research has been in the field of Indian politics and women's issues. Her research papers have been published in a number of national and international journals and publications. She has authored, co-authored, and co-edited many publications, including William Erskine, a monograph in the series Founders and Guardians of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, Women in Indian Society, Culture and the Making of Identity in Contemporary India, Zero Point Bombay in and around Horniman Circle, Politics in Maharashtra, Kautilya's Arthashastra, and Women's Studies series in Gujarati. Her outstanding research work includes an in-depth study of various aspects of Mahatma Gandhi's life and his contribution to India's freedom struggle. The book, Understanding Gandhi in Conversation with Fred J. Bloom, makes interesting reading. Her book titled Gandhi in Bombay Towards Swaraj provides a detailed account of Gandhi's stay in Bombay during the struggle for independence and contains a wealth of information on this period which is not easily available elsewhere. The trustees, managing committee, and the members of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai are privileged to confer an honorary fellowship on Professor Usha Thakkar for her contribution to women's studies and Gandhian studies. Professor Usha Thakkar. Signora Stefania Costanza, fellow awardees, 
the President of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, Mr. S. G. Kare, the trustees, the managing committee, members of the society, distinguished guests and friends. The Asiatic Society of Mumbai has done me a great honor by bestowing on me its honorary fellowship. I'm grateful to the trustees, the president, the managing committee, and the members of the society for this recognition of my work. The honorary fellowship of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, the premier institution of knowledge and learning in Western India, means a lot to me personally. It is here that I understood that the journeys of ideas are often long and at times even discursive, but ultimately fruitful and enriching. Intellectual quests are multi-layered and multi-dimensional. Peeping into the treasure of knowledge in the library here, listening to the lectures of the renowned scholars from different parts of the world, as well as interacting with scholars like Dr. R. P. Kangle, Durgavai Bhagwat, and Dr. Arun Tikekar have widened my intellectual horizons. It is here that I became once again aware that Mumbai of today is enriched through the heritage of Bombay of yesterday. This metropolis, the witness of powerful ambitions and economic prosperity, has also been the place for new ideas, intellectual stimulations, cultural diversities, and social change. Looking back, I realize that many have been instrumental in shaping my journey of ideas and work. I'm fortunate to have been associated with the institutions like the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, SNDT Women's University, Banasthali Vidyapit, and Mani Bhavan Gandhi Sangrahale. My working at SNDT Women's University deepened my interest in women's issues, women's movements, and women's studies, and helped me to develop a perspective. The latter half of the 70s and the first half of the 80s was an exciting period. The women's movements were shifting from margin to the center. My associations with Banasthali Vidyapit and Mani Bhavan Gandhi Sangrahale further strengthened my interest in women's studies and Gandhian studies. And having Professor Usha Mehta as my PhD guide was a stroke of good fortune. I was getting drawn to the ideas and philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi. I increasingly realized that Gandhi's journey to truth, his commitment to nonviolence, his being one with the suffering humanity, and his courage to question the injustice and inequality are still of crucial importance. Mani Bhavan Sangrahale embodies the precious memories of the Mahatma and the strong links between the Mahatma and Mumbai. An exercise to capture the memories, large and small, is not an exercise that can ever be completed. Life presence, a rainbow of ideas and ideals, experience and imagination, it gives diverse perceptions and interpretations of the old and the new, the exercise of capturing even a shade or two of these fascinating colors is enticing. I wish to conclude by saying that I am fortunate having received the support from the institutions I have been associated with and also my family and friends. I am glad that some of them are present here. In the end, a big thank you to the Asiatic Society of Mumbai and to all of you. Thank you. Our um, final recipient today is Dr. Farooq Udwadia, and I have taken the privilege of reading the citation. Udwadia, MD, FRCP, Edinburgh, FRCP, London, FAMS, Master, FCCP, 
FACP, Doctor of Science with Honours. His list of achievements in the field of medicine would fill an entire volume. This citation will just be skimming the surface. Farouk Udwadia distinguished himself in academics when he was awarded a distinction in medicine at both the MBBS and MD examinations by the University of Bombay, receiving almost every scholarship and every medal the university had to offer at these examinations, including the Prince of Wales Gold Medal and the Dr. C.S. Patel Gold Medal. In 1969, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, at the age of 38 years, the youngest Indian ever to be so elected. A brief overview of his hospital attachments would start from 1958, when he was appointed Honorary Consultant Physician to the B.D. Pittit Parsi General Hospital. In 1964, he was appointed Consultant Physician and Consultant in Charge of the Intensive Care Unit at the Breach Candy Hospital, both of which positions he continues to hold till date. In 1977, he was appointed Consultant Physician to the Governor of Maharashtra. Since 1989, he has been Emeritus Professor of Medicine, Grant Medical College, and JJ Group of Hospitals. He has published 10 books on various diagnostic issues that deal with respiratory and pulmonary problems and the handling of medical emergencies. Noteworthy among these are Principles of Critical Care, 1995, the first book of its kind in India, besides being among the very few in Southeast Asia. Man and Medicine, a History, published in 2000, stands out as the first work that deals with the history of medicine in Southeast Asia. The 1994 work on tetanus is considered the standard international monograph on this subject. His most recent work titled Tabyat, Medicine and Healing in India, has been very well received. He has over 60 publications in international and national journals, chiefly dealing with respiratory medicine, tropical eosinophilia, tetanus, and critical care medicine. Amongst his numerous awards are the Padma Bhushan in 1987 for contribution to medicine, the Dhanvantri Award in 1996, the Dr. B.C. Roy National Award in 2000 in the category of Eminent Medical Teacher, and in 1997, the Master Fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians, the only Indian and second Asian to be conferred this award, and which has been given to only 12 individuals in the world in over 60 years since the founding of the college. The trustees, managing committee, and members of the Asiatic Society feel privileged to confer an honorary fellowship on Dr. Farooq Iraj Udwadia for his outstanding contribution to the world of medicine.
uh, Mr. Kale, President of the Asiatic Society, Senora Stefan Constanza, members on this dais, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank the Society for giving this honor to me. I don't know whether I really deserve it or not. When I first got to know of it, uh, I asked two questions. Uh, why me? Because, uh, you know, this learned society is a society basically for history, for humanities, and for the preservation of our old heritage. Now, I'm just a physician practicing medicine. And everybody thinks that medicine is a science, and I don't think this august uh, society has very much to do with science in the true sense of the word. But I think people don't realize that medicine is both an art and a science. And even when you consider it as a science, it is not a science in the true sense of the word, because a good bit of medicine is still unscientific. So this is only one who has been practicing medicine for such a long time does indeed realize. Now when I say medicine is an art, let me define medicine as has been defined by a great physician in the 20th century, William Osler, when he said that you can define medicine as an art which is supposed to come to a conclusion on incomplete evidence. <laughs> so you can well imagine, you know, how important it is for a, for a physician to be, in a way, a judge. Now, uh, why, well, the point is that though this society deals with humanities, humanism and humanity is an essential feature of myths. It lies at the core of pits. It is that which bonds the doctor and the patient into a close-knit, trusting relationship that has stood the test of time. So that's one major way in which you might say that the humanities, that this august society perpetrates, holds, and cherishes, is in a way linked also to the uh, practice of medicine. I'd just like to make one short comment. You heard so many speakers. And I would like the society to know the one contribution that it has made uh, to an important part of the history of medicine. And that is being able to tell us the age and the century in which the great Charaka practiced. Nobody knew when he practiced, though the Charaka Samhita had been known for several, several centuries. It was through the translation of the Boer's manuscript that the time of the practice and the life of Charaka was established. The Boer's manuscript, really speaking, initially, the manuscript itself was in Sanskrit and Parikit, and it was owned by a monk called Yasho Mista, who was in a monastery along the Silk Road in the town of Kuga, which was a trading post. And when Yasho Mista died, a stupa was built where he and his belongings were kept. And this is how the Bowers manuscript came up. Lieutenant Hamilton Bowers, in 1890, was asked by the British government to try and see if could solve the murder of a Scottish man called Mr. Dalglier. He had been murdered by an Afghan tribesman. And when he was camping in that area, some treasure hunters who were scooping around the stupa of Yashamitra came up and offered this manuscript to him. He must have been a wise man, but he decided that it was something worth taking. What did he do with it? He didn't understand what it was, so he sent it to the Asiatic Society of Bengal. 
And there, a very intelligent Englishman called Mr. I think it's Corelli or Creoli, I can't exactly pronounce his name, translated and showed first for the first time that the name of Charaka was mentioned in this manuscript and that it was in the 5th century AD that he was supposed to have been there. And this message then was, look at the honesty of the man, he gave it back to this lieutenant and the lieutenant decided that this was too precious a con uh, thing to keep on his own and he sent it on to the Bodelin Library in Oxford where it still is. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'd like to end, except to tell you this, that this August Institute has a great heritage and it has kept this heritage going. What has it done? It has looked at the past and recorded it, and that is so indeed, indeed so very important. When on one of my rounds I asked somebody about the past, he, the answer was, why do you want to know about the past? How am I going to cure this patient if you tell me about so and so was right in the past? The answer is that the past is extremely important for the simple reason that unless you know the past, you can never understand the present. And unless you know the present and past, you can never even dream of what is going to happen in the future. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, that brings us to um, the end of the first part of our program for today. Of course, may I say the very, very important part of the program. But um, we also have some important books to release. First of all, we have three monographs uh, to release in the series, The Founders and Guardians of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, uh, where um, Dr. Usha Thakkar has been uh, chairing and helping out. And I would um, request um, Stefania to um, uh, launch this today. Um, and then we can hear from the writers themselves who are present. So um, if um, we can start with, uh, then there's Captain James McModo by Kunjalata. Shah and Arthur Bedford Oliver by Brunda Patare. Thank you. Grateful to our three writers today. Um, we would also like to hear from them individually. Um, can I request uh, Madhavi Kamath to, yeah, to give her views uh, as she worked on this monograph? And as you come up, Madhavi, um, one by one, we would also like to felicitate you for having achieved what you have achieved. So before you start, um, maybe um, um, Stefania. <laughs> gentlemen. I'm extremely honored that my monograph on Major General Vance Kennedy is being released today in the presence of this August audience. And I'm grateful to the Asiatic Society of Mumbai for publishing the monograph. Major General Vance Kennedy was a renowned Oriental scholar, linguist, and antiquarian. For 30 years, from 1817 to 1846, he had a long scholarly association with our society. 
He was the secretary of the Literary Society of Bombay and later the president of the Bombay branch of the Royal Asiatic Society. In fact, he was the first person to hold both these posts in the history of the society. For his scholarly contributions, General Kennedy was awarded the coveted title of the honorary president. Only three gentlemen have been bestowed with this honor. Our founder, Sir James McIntosh, Major General Vance Kennedy, and his successor, Reverend Dr. John Wilson. Vance Kennedy was in the Army of the East India Company and donned important staff assignments as the Judge Advocate General of the Bombay Army, as the Oriental Translator to Government, and as the Colonel of the Regiment, 4th Regiment Bombay Native Infantry. In early 1800, as a young infantry officer, he was dangerously wounded in a campaign in Malabar and read six papers at the meeting of the society, which were published in the Journal of the Society. As a teenager, Vance Kennedy came to India in 1800 and lived and died in India and was buried here in Mumbai in 1846. After his death, to his, in his honor, the society raised a fund to which not just the members but also his friends, admirers, and well-wishers, both British and Indians, contributed. This fund was used to erect a handsome tombstone on his grave, which unfortunately I could not find in spite of all my efforts, as it lies buried deep under a municipal garden. Writing this monograph proved to be a happy and adventurous journey. And in this journey, many people, known unknown, helped and supported me. And I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude towards them. Apart from the society as a whole, I would like to thank the President, Shri Sharat Kale, and the members of the Edit Board, Dr. Usha Thakkar, Dr. Murdula Ramanna, Professor Mangala Sardesh Pandey, and Shri Yogesh Kamdar, for their thorough evaluation and valuable suggestions about my manuscript. Kale Saheb and Usha Ben in particular went out of their may way in making gentle inquiries about the progress of my monograph from time to time. Their patience and encouragement was a real morale booster. Professor Vispe Balapuriya, the honorary secretary, gave me permissions and good reference which gave me easy access to all the reference material in the society and in other institutions as well. My senior colleagues, Dr. Meena Vaishampayan and Murnal Kulkarni, helped me in locating certain important references. I would also like to thank the staff of the society, especially C.G. Mane, A.J. Victor, and Vijay Rikame for the help that they had extended. My friend and business partner, Amala Nevalkar, did the toughest job of maintaining silence in the office while I was writing and sharing my professional burden. So I was able to devote more time to complete my monograph. This work is a result of a pure fact-finding research endeavor in which I could find more about Vance Kennedy's military career, which otherwise was not able was not available in the literary circles. I extend my heartfelt thanks to all the military veterans and serving officers who helped me find more about General Kennedy. Without their intervention, access to the army records and archives would have been difficult and time consuming. Last but not the least, the two people whose presence would have made this moment extremely special for me. Dr. Arun Tikekar, my guru and mentor, to whom I have dedicated this work, and I'm extremely overwhelmed in fulfilling his wish. Second, my father, G.R. Kamath, a writer and editor, from whom I have inherited my literary skills and learned finer nuances of writing. 
Though both Tikekar sir and my father are not in this world, their inspiration remains a powerful guiding force. This monograph was a sincere attempt to keep Vance Kennedy's literary legacy alive. Though my monograph is complete, my search for finding more about this unsung hero is still on. Thank you. President S. G. Kale, Professor Vispi Malapuria, and respected guests. It was late Dr. Arun Tikekar who suggested to me to write a monograph on Captain James McMurdo in view of the fact that my research area has been Gujarat. At that time, I had not heard about him. He, not being a well-known scholar, having no book to his credit, was actually quite unknown to me also. McMurdo was a military officer of the British East India Company who came to India in 1800 from Scotland and became the first British resident of Kutch in 1816. He combined his official duties with quest for knowledge and scholarship to write exhaustive accounts on Kathiawar, Kutch and Sin, uh, which covers history, geography, social and political life of that time. He collected information not only from the books, but also from his minute observations of the places he visited and from the dialogues and communication with the local people. He had learned the Persian, Hindustani and Gujarati languages and also had picked up the dialects of Kachi and Sindhi. He thus could sketch a graphic picture of the social and political life of the early 19th century. He wrote in detail about the social manners, customs, religious practices of the people. Though there is no published book to his credit, his comprehensive accounts on the early 19th century, Kathiawar, Kach and Sin, published in the society's journals and also his government reports are his pioneering seminal works and thus his valuable contribution to the historiography of Gujarat and Sin. This is specially significant because there is very little information available of the early 19th century. Later historians and gazette authors have used them profusely in their works. I would like to thank President Sri S. G. Kale for meticulously going through the draft of my monograph. My special gratitude to Dr. Usha Thakkar for editing minutely my work and also thank her editing team for the encouragement. I also extend my thanks to Professor Balaporia and the staff of the Asiatic Society for their assistance. I thank the Asiatic Society for giving me the opportunity to bring to light the unsung and unknown scholar, James McMurdo, to light. Thank you. Um, our third monograph writer, is Vrunda Patari. Um, I, uh, her work is on Arthur Bedford Oliver. And once again, Stefania, if you could um, just give a look. I have been coming to the Asiatic Society of Mumbai for last 18 years, but I really feel overwhelmed today and also honored at once uh, to just be here amidst such an August gathering and also among the scholar whom I have looked up to uh, since my student days and when I was pursuing history as a career. Um, so thank you Asiatic Society of Mumbai for giving me this opportunity to be here. And belonging to one of the earliest migrant communities to settle in Bombay in 12th century called Pascal Shees, 
I always had a deep connect with the history of this city. I was always curious to know not just the commercial uh, character of the city, but also the contributions that the city has made to shaping, uh, in shaping the intellectual character of our nation as well. And Asiatic Society of Mumbai was always at the center to provide such intellectual stimulations right from uh, the 19th century onwards. And uh, I was really fortunate to get this opportunity uh, to study one of the actors who contributed a lot to the Bombay's intellectual renaissance called Arthur Bedford Orlebar. Uh, Arthur Bedford Orlebar, uh, during his decade-long stint in Bombay, donned mania hat as an educationist, mathematician, meteorologist, geologist, and museum curator, and played a crucial role in bringing about Bombay's intellectual renaissance. He arrived in Bombay in 1835 as the Elphinstone pro professor and was also given charge of the Kulaba Observatory. Born on 11 June 1810 in the county of Bedford in England, Orlebar graduated from Lincoln College, Oxford in 1833. With a degree in mathematics, Arthur Orlebar applied for the Elphinstone Professorship in India announced by the Bombay Native Education Society in honor of departing governor Mount Stuart Elphinston. He also served as a government inspector of schools at Bombay from 1842. As a superintendent of the observatory at Kulaba, he contributed immensely to the initial development of the observatory in the 1840s. Alongside educational responsibilities and astronomical engagements, Orlebar soon got involved with activities of the Bombay branch of Royal Asiatic Society and Bombay Geographical Society. He dedicated himself to enriching the museum collection at the society, uh, and devoted considerable time to classification work and recording antiquities at the museum. Not only did he contribute scholarly articles to the journals of the society, but he also was instrumental in having the first two quarterly journals published uh, here. In 1847, while his course book on mathematics was in progress, he had to take the difficult decision of leaving India since Bombay wasn't proving conducive to his health but he continued his work as an educationist after his departure to England and then to Australia, uh, where he was also the government inspector of schools at Melbourne, uh, a position he continued until his death on 11 June 1866. And I was really fortunate when uh, Dr. Arun Tikekar uh, you know, suggested this name to me because I always had interest in pursuing the history of science and technology, though my work is in business history. Uh, but when he suggested this name, I actually had no clue about this person. But when I started exploring, and I uh, really fondly remember Dr. Arun Tikekar because he initially guided me when I was, uh, you know, doing this research. He also led me to the records of the Bombay Geographical Society, and I also thank uh, Vispi Balaporia. Uh, who gave me that access to these records. And uh, without actually his uh, initial guidance, I wouldn't have been uh, here talking about this monograph. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Kale, President of the Society, and also the editorial board, uh, including Dr. Usha Thakkar, um, Dr. Brudula Ramanna, Professor uh, Mangala Sadesh Pandey, and Mr. Yogesh Kamdar. Uh, for constantly supporting us while we were actually pursuing the monograph. And I especially thank Dr. Uh, Thakkar because I, uh, you know, sometimes I was almost on the verge of giving up due to my other professional commitments and she was the source of inspiration and she motivated me that, no, please, you know, you can complete this. So thank you, Dr. Thakkar, for your constant inspiration. And uh, Dr. Mrudula Ramanna and Dr. Indira Choudhury, uh, since I had took interest in science and technology, were always the inspiration. And they graciously accepted uh, to review my uh, work uh, in, uh, on Orlebar, whose contribution to mathematics and observatory were really tremendous. And I really thank them. I wish actually Dr. Mrudula Ramanna was here. Uh, I also actually um, would like to thank uh, my copy editors, uh, who had to really put up with me, um, uh, Sapna and uh, Priya Ayer from The Word Jockey, who actually painstakingly went through my monograph. And also I uh, would like to thank Sonavi, uh, who is the publisher, who accommodated our last minute changes as well uh, in the monograph. So thank you for that. 
and uh, of course uh, my friends, my family, uh, and some of them are here, and my colleagues at work who really tolerated my eccentricities uh, while I was at the uh, you know, end of the uh, project, while I was writing the monograph. Um, so without their support, I wouldn't have uh, done this. Uh, and I hope that uh, you know, the trust that these people have showed in me, my monograph does justice uh, to their trust. And uh, there is actually this is not an end because I realized after finishing the monograph there is much more to this uh, side of Orlebar and there is much more to be done uh, to the development of sciences and technology and how the Asiatic has really played a pivotal role in that. Um, so I think this is just the beginning and there are limitations of course for this monograph but then there is much more to come. So thank you once again uh, everyone who had supported me. Thank you. So we've been following our um, program quite meticulously, but now we have a little um, insertion. So although it is time actually for us to hear our president, Mr. Kale, with his presidential address, we have suddenly found that we have another book to release. So uh, a few minutes of patience, and uh, we have... Um, I make a mistake. Mr. Kali has been trying to teach me. Kusumish uh, Akiana. Akiana is story, tale of this lady, Gusumisha. And here we have the book, so if it... So this has been, um, of course, Dr. Jamkedkar is the head of this whole project but they have been working very hard and, and they have succeeded in having the book ready for release today. Prepared. Um, but yeah. Would you like to? Yes, I'm sure. If you allow me, I have also the other copies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Since we all love books, it's been a wonderfully rewarding evening for all of us. Uh, Mr. Kale, may I invite you for the presidential address? Sinora Stefania Constanza, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Consul General, Consulate of Italy, our uh, Chairman of the Trustees, Professor J.V. Naik, he was here, but he has left now. Other honorable trustees are there. Office bearers and members of the managing committee, members of the society and friends. This has been quite a remarkable evening which we spend amongst recognized scholars. Of course, we consider that there are many scholars, not necessarily on this side of the dais, but on the other side of the dais also. I uh, give my heartfelt felicitations to all the distinguished scholars on whom the society has had the privilege of conferring its honorary fellowships in the course of the program today. Before proceeding further, I would like to pay our sincere homage to the courageous officers and constables of the Mumbai Police and the National Security Guards who sacrificed their lives while fighting the terrorist attack on Mumbai on 26th November 2008. 
members of the staff of the Taj and Trident hotels, as well as the staff of the railways at the CS or the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj terminal, who did their best in a very difficult situation to protect the lives of innocent persons. We convey our deep sense of grief to the families who lost their dear ones in this brutal attack. At the same time, I must mention, as has been mentioned earlier, that 26th November happens to be the Constitution Day. It was on 26th November 1949 that the Constitution of India was adopted by the Constituent Assembly. Many of the scholars, while speaking, have given very generous compliments to the Asiatic Society. So I would like to give you a, a brief overview of the activities of the society. The society has set up Dr. Arun Tikekar Center for Advanced Studies. It is interested with the task of administering the Dr. Arun Tikekar Memorial Research Fellowship for research scholarship. First such scholarship was conferred on the renowned artist, Mr. Suhas Bahulkar, who has chosen the subject of history of the Bombay Revivalist School. The second scholarship was given to Mr. Ajay Kautikwar. He will be working on the subject of journalism, challenges of the new media and technology. The society for last three years has been engaged in the library digitization project, which was inaugurated by the Honorable Governor, who is also the chief patron of the society, Sri C. H. Vidya Sagar Rao, in August 19, uh, 2015. The project was undertaken with the financial assistance of Rs. 5 crore from Government of Maharashtra. 25,800 books have been digitized from the government grant. In addition, about 8,000 books have been digitized with the help of corporate and individual donations. Apart from the digitization of old, rare, and valuable books, 1,600 maps and nearly 2,500 manuscripts have also been digitized. The society has a unique collection of old newspapers which have been microfilmed and digitized. All the digitized material will be displayed in due course on the web portal called Grantha Sanjeevani, which can be accessed by any scholar anywhere in the world. The website was launched by Dr. Mahesh Sharma, Minister of State for Culture, Government of India, on 15th January this year. So far, because the uploading of books takes a little time. The book has to have the proper metadata in its proper format, because we want these books which are uploaded to be fully searchable. We also want more and more persons to go to this, access this web portal. And then, if they are delighted to become subscribers of the portal. The, uh, the fee is very, very, very uh, small. That is what we think. It's just 2,400 rupees for the whole year and there are concessions for the life members and annual members. The web portal has attracted viewers and subscribers from all over the world. The society is taking earnest efforts to increase the number of institutional subscribers. Not being satisfied with the grant of rupees 5 crores from the state government, the society has also approached the Ministry of Culture for phase two of the project, which would cost again around rupees five crores, 
because then only we would have done fair amount of justice to these old, rare and valuable books in the position of the society. The, sub, the society functions through the subcommittees, which have continued their activities under the able guidance of vice presidents and chairpersons. The Publications Committee has recently brought out J.R.B. Jijibhoi's Bombay Vignettes. And in the next two to three months, the committee will bring out an annotated and enlarged version of Prarthana Samajata Itihas by D.G. Vaidya, which was published 100 years ago. Dr. Raja Dikshit, well-known scholar and historian, is the editor of this new version. The society has continued to bring out monographs, which you have just witnessed. In the series called Founders and Guardians of the Society, which was initiated by late Dr. Arun Tikekar. Soon the original list drawn up by Dr. Tikekar may be exhausted and the society will have to consider phase two of the project. The society is well known for many things and one of them is of course the stalwarts like Dr. P. V. Kane, Mahamopadhyay Kane, who was conferred the Bharat Ratna for his history of Dharma Shastra. And we have set up a Kane Institute in his memory. During the year, three research students, Mr. Ajay Kumar Lokhande, Mr. Mahesh Kalra, and Ms. Afejin Tuscano, who had registered for the PhD in history in the Kane Institute, were awarded the doctorate by the University of Mumbai. <laughs> the Kane Institute has also initiated certificate course in ancient Indian culture, which has continued and is receiving an encouraging response from persons. Besides, a new certificate course in Sanskrit has been started, for which 16 students have enrolled. I would like to mention that our colleague, Dr. Zamkhedkar, who just came here, has been recently appointed as chairman of the Indian Council of Historical Research a prestigious appointment which brings credit to him as well as to the society. Before concluding, I would like to renew my appeal to the members and friends of the society to take an active interest in broadening the base of membership by enrolling more members, especially young scholars. The procedure for admission has been now simplified. Let me end by expressing my sincere thanks to the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, State Government, Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai, Mumbai Metropolitan Regional Development Authority, all individual and institutional donors, especially the Rotary Club of Bombay, media persons, auditors, members of the staff, and all members of the society. Thank you. So we can now conclude this event um, with a few words of thanks. And I will have to begin by thanking Signora Stefania Costanza for being such a good friend of the Asiatic Society, <laughs> for having agreed the moment I asked her if she would accept our invitation, and uh, for becoming a consular member of the Asiatic Society and I think for encouraging others, because I think the um, 
your connections with the Australian Consul will probably also get us one more consular membership. So thank you so very much, and uh, I hope we didn't keep you too busy this evening. Thank you, Stefania. And we look forward to further association with you. Um, and of course, for the lovely book that you brought, which will give us a further interest in Italy. I thank all the distinguished recipients for having accepted the honorary fellowship, having done us the honor of accepting, and for sharing their valuable views with us today. I thank the trustees who were present today for their encouragement and support whenever needed. Thank you for always being there for the Asiatic Society. I must thank the citation readers for their excellent renditions, and they read out the citations. Also, the monograph writers for the hard work they've done, for the lot of research they put in, and I'm sure they're feeling very happy today that their work has reached fulfillment. I must thank the students, past and present, of Wilson College, my college, Dr. Udwadia's college as well, uh, and, yeah, Vijay, Wilson College, What's Wilson College, yes, I didn't know that, oh, another Wilsonian, we're very proud of Wilson College. And uh, Dr. John Wilson is watching us there, and I'm sure feeling very proud of what we have accomplished today. So thank you, students, for always coming when we ask them to come and help, and for bringing that youthful touch to our proceedings. I also have to thank the staff of the Asiatic Society, because they've had to put in a lot of extra effort to enable us to carry out this event today. Finally, thank you so very much, all of you, for having been here today. Without you, we couldn't really have made a success of the evening. Good night. <laughs>